Okay, thanks everyone for coming today. Yeah, it is really my pleasure to introduce you Benjamin Nauert. Uh, he got his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley in 2015. Yes. With Rana, working with Rona Cohen. Uh, during his PhD, Ben, ben participated in two different research field campaigns, DC3 and Seekers, uh, to collect observations for his thesis. Uh, his title was Observational Constraints on Upper Tropospheric NOx Emissions, Lifetime, and Oxidative Products. In his work, he measured for the first time in the atmosphere methyl peroxynitrate, nitrate, and, for the, and he determined the lifetime of NOx in the near field of the a thunderstorm, along with constraining oxidation rate of constants of NOx to its products. Uh, right now, Ben is working with, at CU with Jose Luis Jimenez, uh, he's doing operating the high resolution time of flight mass spectrometer on the NASA DC-8 and the NASA Corus Air Quality Field Study, and during during ATOM2, he's now working on understanding the sources of SOA from the Corus Air Field Campaign and other mega cities around the world, and how secondary organic aerosol impact mortality due to poor air quality, and what the submicron aerosol acidities across the world. And he's also trying to understand global transport models, how transport models represent aerosol acidity. And welcome. Uh, is this? Let's welcome Ben now. All right. Thank you guys for the opportunity for me to come in today to talk about two projects that I've been working on that I'm very excited about. And if you came here either freaking out because you thought if you're high school English classes or you were hoping for a literature discussion on this book, I'm sorry, that's not what we're, we're going to be talking about today. But instead, I'll be looking at multiple megacities and how they impact and produce secondary organic aerosols and their sources and how this impacts mortality around the world. Real briefly, I want to acknowledge my numerous co-authors. And as I said, I'm doing two studies and using a lot of data from these studies, so a lot of co-authors but especially Dusong Zhou for his work with Geoschem that I'll be showing towards the end of the talk, um, discussions with Davin Henze about how to relate particulate matter concentration to mortality, and discussions with Jules de Gau and Brian McDonald on emission sources, as well as Christoph Knot with the work that he's done for FlexPart. So I really like this picture that we took outside of the DC-8 during the Korean United States Air Quality Campaign, or Chorus AQ, in 2016. A, it's showing how low the DC-8 is getting over Seoul in comparison to this tower that was being built, which is much higher than these buildings. But this is still considered a relatively clean day in Seoul, even though you can barely see the horizon and everything back there. As we know, megacities or areas with 5 to 10 million people in a small area are strongly impacted by poor air quality, which is mainly from smog or particulate matters, as well as ozone. But to really understand what is causing this smog, we have to know what the composition of the aerosol is in order to know what the emissions are to reduce this. And in many studies that have been done, they've related the concentration of particulate matter to mortality, and we see in this work from Jules Levevold that a lot of the megacities like Mexico City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Eastern China, Seoul, Tokyo, Paris, and London all highlight with very high mortality rates because they have high concentrations of particulate matter, and as you increase the particulate matter, you get more premature deaths. But... As I said, we need to know what the composition is so we can start targeting the emissions. And the aerodyne aerosol mass spectrometer has been a great tool to really start understanding what the composition and concentration of submicron aerosols are. What I'm showing here is an overview of average composition and concentrations from various megacities around the world, where green is secondary organic aerosol, gray is primary organic aerosol, red is sulfate, blue is nitrate, and orange is ammonium. But the big thing that you should take from this is that for um, submicron aerosol, most of the aerosol is secondary species, meaning that it's not being directly emitted, but instead it's the emissions of the primary gases such as NOx, SO2, and all your hydrocarbons that are oxidizing to produce these particulate matter. And secondary organic aerosol is an important, if not dominating, 
portion of the submicron aerosol, on average contributing 30% of the total mass. And in general, the primary emissions, including black carbon, contribute a small fraction of the total submicron mass. So as my title implies, today I'm going to be mainly focusing on secondary organic aerosol. And the main reason is that this has been a huge challenge for us to try to model. The reason behind that is there's hundreds to thousands of hydrocarbon precursors with the same amount of reactions to produce secondary organic aerosol versus just for nitrate and sulfate, you have NO2 and SO2. The reactions are generally simpler and more well understood, so it's generally easier to model, though it's still a challenge. So what I'm plotting here is from Alma Hodge's work in 2010 where she compared SOA observed from various campaigns to modeled. Blue, if we focus on that first, is when we just take the traditional model and assume that we're only care about aromatics and small air, um, alkanes, and that was the traditional thought that those were the main SOA precursors. And we see that across campaigns from urban to remote regions, when we just take this traditional point of view of SOA production, we were missing SOA by an order to two orders of magnitude. But once we started adding non-traditional precursors in the volatility basis set, including a larger range of volatility for these precursors, we started getting within a factor of two or three of the SOA predicted by models versus observed. And in seven years' time, we're still only getting within a factor of two. So instead of observe versus model in this paper, I switched the axis around just to confuse you, that's modeled versus observed. And again, we're still only getting within a factor of two of the observations. And only after one day of aging in the model, we're starting to get within the uncertainty of the AMS. So there's still a lot of uncertainty on the production and sources of secondary organic aerosol. And a big reason of is behind this is the debate of the main gas phase precursors of secondary organic aerosol. So Chris Kappa, in his 2016 paper, he looked at different assumptions about how you lose VOCs to Teflon walls, which are used to calculate SOA yields and production. So this was assuming no loss, low losses, and high losses. And he then ran this model for central Los Angeles. But the big takeaway from this figure is that their predictions is that most of the SOA was coming from biogenics with a small fraction from aromatics and a negligible amount from semi and intermediate volatile organic compounds. And these are compounds that many people in the community are hypothesizing are the main sources of SOA. But Patrick Hayes, in a different paper, had a very different conclusion where he said that most of the SOA was coming from semi-volatile and intermediate volatile organic compounds and basically nothing from biogenics. So there's this debate going on of how much biogenics play a role in urban areas and how important is IVOC and SVOC for urban areas for SOA production. So since models can give you very contrasting ideas and there can be a lot of complexity within a model to try to understand the sources of SOA, what I've been using is this conceptual model with observations to try to understand SOA production in urban areas. So this is something that Yost de Gao and Pete DiCarlo brought up in their papers of how to think about it is that you have some background air vecting over a city where you have background carbon monoxide, organic aerosol, secondary organic aerosol precursors, and photochemical products and precursors that include ozone, formaldehyde, and PAN. While at the same time, as this air is coming over the city, you have a primary emissions of carbon monoxide, primary organic aerosol, secondary organic aerosol, and the photochemical product precursors of, again, ozone, pan, and formaldehyde. So as this air mixes and advects downwind, you have mixing with the surrounding air and dilution. So you can conceptually think at any point while you're measuring air moving away from the city, it's the concentration at any point is the combination of its background, its source, and its production. So with this conceptual model in mind, we can start thinking, I can introduce the questions I've been trying to understand with the two projects I've been working on. First is going to be focusing on observations I collected over Seoul during the Korean United States air quality campaign and really trying to understand what the urban SOA production in Seoul is as a test case. In particular, trying to understand what the contribution of transport versus local emissions are for the city. Then from the results and conclusions from this study, I'll go into trying to understand what 
how does urban SOA compare across cities, and how can we use the, um, these observations to constrain the production of SOA? And then finally, how many deaths can be prevented if urban SOA is completely removed from the atmosphere? So first I'm going to be looking at the observations that I collected over Seoul. So Seoul provides a very interesting but challenging area to try to understand urban SOA because it's surrounded by two very big urban regions, including the Beijing Tianjin area right here and Shanghai. And it's been shown that both of these regions can influence the air quality and particulate matter of Seoul. So during the campaign, our big question in general was, what are the sources of particulate matter to the region and how big of an influence are the emissions? And in particular, I've been focusing on the sources of organic aerosol and secondary organic aerosol precursors. So as a brief e overview of the campaign, I was on board the NASA DC-8, and this is a picture of us getting ready to take off to go to Seoul from Southern California. And I'll be mainly focusing on the data I collected on the airplane. We had around 25 instrument teams with around 40 to 50 instruments on the airplane. So it was a heavily payloaded um, airplane that will provide a lot of observations and constraints on different aspects of air quality, including ozone and aerosol. So the DC-8 was stationed just south of Seoul at Osan Air Force Base, and we did a total of 20 research flights. And the general idea that we did for the research flights is at 8 a.m. we would take off from Osan Air Force Base, fly very low over Seoul to capture what was happening in Seoul around 8, 9 in the morning. Then when we got over a forested region, we would spiral up high to around 25, 30,000 feet, and then we would fly one of three jetways, the West Sea, the Jeju Jetway or the Busan Jetway. And these were selected due to questions about meteorology, air quality, and other things that came up with the model. And we would fly di four different altitude legs on these jetways, then come back to Seoul around lunchtime, fly low around Seoul again, spiral up, and then pick one of these jetways again for the afternoon. And then around 3 p.m. or so, we would go to Seoul again, fly low, and then go back to base. So we got a lot of um, measurements within Seoul during this campaign, around 60 misapproaches in Seoul, which provides a nice wealth of data set to really look at secondary organic aerosol production in Seoul during this campaign. And here are pictures of us doing our misapproach over Seoul. This is the Air Force Base that we did the most approach over and us flying low over all the residential areas over Seoul, south of the river. So first let's step back and take a big picture view of what is the average particulate matter composition during the campaign. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing here on observations collected over Seoul and the West Sea. And again, green is secondary organic aerosol, blue is nitrate, red is sulfate, orange is ammonium, purple is chloride, black is black carbon, and gray is primary organic aerosol. We see that over Seoul, on average during the campaign, it was 31 micrograms of aerosol. So high concentrations, and it's mainly composed of secondary organic aerosol and nitrate, and these are species that are related to photochemistry. And we see that th though there is a large fraction of primary organic aerosol, most of the organic aerosol is secondary in nature with a 10 microgram secondary organic aerosol, 3 micrograms from primary. But in comparison, over the West Sea during most of the flights, what I call the clean conditions, which was the average of five research flights, we see that the con total concentration of particulate matter was much less than what was observed over Seoul, and that sulfate is a much larger contributor compared to nitrate in the secondary organic aerosols, and that there was basically no primary organic aerosol in the organic aerosol, it's mainly secondary. So just from this comparison right here, we can safely say that the increase in particulate matter during most of the campaign was most likely due to local emissions and very rapid photochemistry. However, there was one research flight where we were measuring um, transported pollution from Shanghai that was coming towards South Korea, and our average concentration was much higher during that flight, and the secondary organic aerosol was comparable to what we saw to Seoul. 
So this can lead to slight disambiguity in trying to disentangle how much of this transport impacted the concentrations here versus how much of this was photochemistry, production of secondary organic aerosol. So if we go back to this conceptual model, the first thing we really need to try to understand is the background error so that we can say, safely say how much was produced. <clears throat> so to do that, what I'll be looking at in particular is carbon monoxide. What Christophe Canote did for the campaign was that he ran flexpart Lagrangian trajectories, but with that he also included emissions from different sources that were within a boxed region of South Korea. So they included eastern China, Hong Kong, Japan, North Korea, etc. So basically anytime the air touched the ground, he would get emission from that region, and then he would follow how that tracer evolved as it went to where the airplane was sampling. These calculations provided an opportunity for us to calculate how much the air we were sampling was South Korean in nature versus foreign influence. The one drawback with these calculations, though, was that he did not include hemispheric background. So if we take the flex part point of view at first for what we observed over the West Sea, not surprisingly, we see basically 100% of the CO is coming from foreign sources, mainly China and Hong Kong. But with the observations, there's obviously a hemispheric background perspective with that. So what I did was I took NOAA observations of carbon monoxide in Mongolia and western China, which are all upland of urban regions, and calculated what the average CO background was from those regions. And during the campaign, it was 140 ppbv, and it was that concentration for the last six years, so it's very constant. So what I did was I at, looked at the average CO observed by the DCA during the campaign over the West Sea and broke it up as 140 ppv BV as the hemispheric background and the rain, remaining part of the CO is the background from the areas around the West Sea, so mainly China. And then with the um, calculations from FlexPAR, I was able to calculate what the dilution rate of CO is with the surrounding background air as it goes to Seoul. And it takes one day to go from where we were observing the West Sea to Seoul, so a very long time to dilute. So with those calculations, the um, hemispheric background obviously remained constant, but then the CO from the surrounding regions went down to about, went down 60 ppbv, so the total background was around 200 parts per billion by volume. So then the remaining CO that we measured over Seoul had to be from local emissions, which is what is shown here. Then the final constraint that FlexPart provided is that it could show if the C signature of CO from foreign regions was changing as the air was aging. If it was changing as the air was aging, it would indicate that there was unequal contribution of foreign sources during the campaign, whereas if it remained constant, the background relatively remained constant during the campaign. And that's what I'm showing here is that the fraction of CO from South Korea versus foreign regions versus oxidation of the air remained relatively constant. So we could, to first order, safely assume that the CO background was relatively constant during the campaign. So now that we have an idea of the CO background, we can start looking at the production of organic aerosol and other species. So how this conceptually works is, I'm showing a figure here from Jason Schroeder from the winter campaign where he nicely demonstrates how to think about enhancements of organic aerosol and enhancements of CO in a plume. So this was a flight where they were sampling New York City plume as it was leaving New York City and heading towards the Atlantic Ocean. And they were in background air, background air, and then suddenly they hit a plume and then they were back out background air again, where green is organic aerosol and black is carbon monoxide. So if we just subtract this background, here, background air here, then we can get the enhancements of organic aerosol and carbon monoxide over background. And that's what is this figure showing here. So this delta OA is the enhancement of OA over background, and this delta CO is the enhancement of CO over background. And the reason we divide OA by CO is to account for any dilution that will happen in mixing of the air, as the oxidation or production of CO is much slower than the dilution rate of CO with the surrounding air. And we call this the dilution corrected concentration. 
And then we plot this versus photochemical age, which is just a relationship of pick your favorite trace species out there. And it just gives you a marker of the OH exposure, so how much chemistry has happened to that air. So for Corus AQ, we see that for the primary organic aerosol, it remains very constant and flat, as one would hope that you're not getting new emissions of primary organic aerosol as you sample more aged air. But what that also indicates is when you plot the total OA concentration versus full chemical age, this growth in the concentration is all due to production of secondary organic aerosols. And in comparison with other megacities around the world, where again, this is the dilution corrected OA concentration versus full chemical age, and green is the observations from Seoul, and all the lines are from various megacities that have been measured around the world, including Mexico City, Los Angeles, and China and Beijing, we see that the production is much higher and typically more rapid than what's been observed in many cities around the world, including what's been observed in China in the dark purple or the light orange. And even during the campaign, if we calculate the dilution corrected OA concentration over the West Sea during the one transport event where they had very high, we measured very high concentrations, the value is still much lower than what was observed over Seoul. So this strongly suggests that the production of secondary organic aerosol oversold during most of the campaign was due to local emissions and chemistry. However, there could be different sources of chemistry, being aqueous, nighttime chemistry, or daytime chemistry. So the next thing I looked at was how secondary organic aerosol correlated with other photochemical species. So what I'm plotting here is a time series of secondary organic aerosol in green, and then you'll be seeing ozone in gray, formaldehyde in blue, pan in yellow as a big diamond, and the sum of all proxy nitrates in yellow as a small diamond. And this is from various Smith's approaches that we did during course AQ. And you see that the time series of secondary organic aerosol with all these photochemical species is very similar, and then on average, during the entire campaign, there is a robust correlation of secondary organic aerosol with ozone, formaldehyde, pan, and the sum of proxy nitrates. So this strongly suggests that the source of the secondary organic aerosol is through photochemistry and that there's minimal influence from aqueous chemistry and nighttime chemistry. But we can take this one step further and look at the normalized dilution corrected concentration of ozone, formaldehyde, pan, and some proxy nitrates, as well as SOA to see, are we seeing production in the West Sea versus Seoul? So this is for the one flight that we sampled in the West Sea where we had the polluted transport from Shanghai. And this is the average for the rest of the time in the West Sea. And we see that on average, all these dilution corrected concentrations are staying flat. There's minimal production going on during this transport. However, on average, over Seoul during the campaign, we're seeing very rapid production of all these species during the day. <clears throat> so what this indicates are two big things. First, the SOA is mainly coming from the photochemistry of the hydrocarbons. Conceptually, you can think of it as your volatile organic compounds are quickly oxidizing in the presence of hydroxyl, radical, hydroxyl radicals to produce oxygenated volatile organic compounds, which undergo some further oxidation and chemistry to partition in the secondary organic aerosol. And in the presence of NOx, you can produce oxygenated volatile organic compounds that include formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and methylglyoxal, as well as ozone. And then acetaldehyde and methylglyoxal are important pan precursors. So that's why we're seeing these correlations through the photochemistry. But the other important thing is that both pan and formaldehyde have very short lifetimes over solder in the campaign. A calculated formaldehyde lifetime of less than three hours and pan lifetime of less than one hour. So the fact that we're seeing correlation of pan and formaldehyde with secondary organic aerosol indicates that it has to be very rapid photochemistry to produce this. Or if it weren't being rapidly produced and being transported, the correlation would go away. So going back to this conceptual model, we generally have a good idea of what's going on with the missions and production in the background. However, one part that I haven't really discussed or touched is what is the influence of secondary organic aerosol precursors on this production? So there were two different ways I approached this. 
First was, again, using the FlexPart model that Christoph ran, but instead of using CO, this time I'm using NO2 with a lifetime of one day. And again, unsurprisingly, we see that over the West Sea, all the NO2 is coming from foreign sources. But as soon as you get over Seoul, most of the NO2 is coming from within South Korean Seoul. The fact that NO2 has a lifetime of one day or less is a good surrogate of other hydrocarbons that we think are important precursors to produce secondary organic aerosols. The fact that we're seeing only basically all the NO2 coming from Seoul would indicate a similar trend for the important hydrocarbons to produce secondary organic aerosols over Seoul. But we had another method to further validate this. So we flew the potential aerosol mass oxidation flow reactor, or OFR, This is something that our group has been working with Aerodyne and Bill Brune on developing and trying to understand the chemistry. And Brett Palm was here, I think, about a year ago giving a seminar on this. But to go over the general idea of the chemistry again, it's basically a flow reactor where you introduce VOCs and secondary organic aerosol into the reactor with UV lights that produce hydroxyl radicals. These hydroxyl radicals react with your volatile organic compounds to produce oxygenated volatile organic compounds that condense to the secondary organic aerosol. So then the enhance the difference in the amount of SOA that you're producing in this flow tube versus outside will tell you the potential amount of aerosol that could be made in that air. So what I'm plotting here is the enhancement of secondary organic aerosol from the OFR. So it's a difference of what's coming out of the OFR versus what we measured in the airplane. And I've split it for very young aged air, so fresh emissions over Seoul, versus older aged air, so not as fresh emissions over Seoul. And during the campaign over Seoul, on average, we're seeing around a seven microgram enhancement of secondary organic aerosols over Seoul which is significantly higher than what we observed over the West Sea by a factor of 3.5 to 4. So this suggests that, yes, the West Sea could be contributing some secondary organic aerosol precursors to Seoul, but most of the secondary organic aerosol precursors in chemistry that's happening to produce it is occurring over Seoul. So what Jose and I did is conceptually create a model to kind of describe all these conclusions in one simplified figure. And some of the simplification steps that we took include assume a flow from the west to the east, represent all the complex mixing with a first order equation that was constrained by observations and flex part, represent the background that were constrained by observations, represent the photochemical aging by a first order rate constant that were constrained by the observations as well, thus Making, getting all the processes represented in one realistic but very simplified picture. So what does that mean? So, for example, we constrain all the observations of the background from the flights that we did along the West Sea, and we have the hemispheric CO background that's constrained by the NOAA observations, and that remains constant. Then we have this CO from other sources that are slowly advecting into Seoul, and while it's doing that, it's undergoing dilution, where SMA is the Seoul metropolitan area. And then once you reach the Seoul metropolitan area, you have this fresh injection of CO that also undergoes dilution. For organic aerosol, it's a little more simple because you generally have no hemispheric background of organic aerosol. So all the background is due to the sources upwind of Seoul. And again, that's undergoing slow dilution as it's evecting into the Seoul metropolitan area. Then you have fresh injections of your primary organic aerosol that undergoes dilution. And your injections of your SOA precursors that rapidly undergo photochemistry and then start undergoing dilution. And you see that this rapid photochemistry leads to a maximum of the secondary organic aerosol and total organic aerosol concentrations in the Seoul metropolitan area. And you have a similar picture for nitrate aerosol and formaldehyde. And for ozone, you see that there's a slightly higher impact from the hemispheric transport of ozone, but you're still increasing ozone a lot with it due to the photochemistry within Seoul. So to recap this part, um, show that the emissions over Seoul overwhelm the OA background from foreign sources, and most of the SOA precursor emissions are from South Korea. 
found that the SOA production was higher and faster than observed in other megacities around the world. It showed that secondary organic aerosol was correlated with short-lived gas species that were made through photochemistry, and that SOA potential was higher over Seoul than over the West Sea. And there's a lot more details about this study that you can find in my ACPD paper that is up right now under review. So now we can start, now that we've done this test case, we can start looking at secondary organic aerosol production across megacities around the world and see, can we learn anything about these? So as I showed earlier, this is again your OA dilution corrected concentration versus full chemical age for oversold during course AQ. And again, it's higher and more rapid than what's been observed around the world. But you see that there's this huge spread for the observations around the world. And if we pick one age particular, about half a photochemical age, where we have observations for most of the cities, we see that there's almost a spread of a factor of six in this dilution corrected concentration. And in fact, this spread has been a question that Jose and Yost have been trying to figure out for years, trying to understand what's been leading to this spread. But it's not only in the SOA um, dilution corrected concentrations. We see this as well when we compare the slopes of SOA versus pick your favorite photochemical species. As an example, I'm showing SOA versus ozone slopes for different cities around the world. And again, we're seeing a spread of around a factor of six in these slopes. And not only for SOA versus ozone, but SOA versus formaldehyde and SOA versus PAN for all these cities around the world. So this is led to me trying to figure out what leads to this variability, and can this variability be used to better understand sources and impacts of the anthropogenic SOA? So the way I've been, I approached this was I took the dilution corrected SOA concentration at half a photochemical age, and I wanted to plot it versus known precursors for SOA that have been measured across cities around the world. And those in particular have been the aromatics, in particular benzene, ethyl benzene, the xylenes, and ethyl benzene. And instead of just plotting it versus the emission ratio of the aromatics, why I'm plotting it is the emission ratio reactivity of the aromatics. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the emission ratio for each compound and I'm multiplying it by its rate constant. And the reason I'm doing that is you can conceptually think of the SOA production at time t being proportional to its OH exposure during that time, its emission ratio time its rates constant, hence the emission ratio reactivity, and its aerosol yield. So with that in mind, what I plotted was the dilution corrected concentration for the emission ratios for these different cities around the world and came up with a surprisingly well-correlated fit of 0.87 for all these missions around the world. So, so then my next question was, could we also do this for the slopes around the world? So what I have is the slope of o SOA versus ozone, and instead of just plotting it as the emission ratio reactivity of aromatics, I'm plotting it as the ratio of that versus the emission ratio reactivity of alkenes. The idea behind it is that aromatics are a representative precursor of the SOA production, and the alkenes, mainly ethylene and propylene, are significant precursors of ozone production, formaldehyde production, and PAN production. So when I plot it like that, see very robust correlation of for ozone, formaldehyde, and PAN. So this is all pointing that it's the emissions and how quickly these emissions are reacting away that are leading to the variability in the SOA production across the cities. But if we go back to this figure, what is very surprising is that the aromatics I use to plot the x-axis, though known SOA precursors, are also known not to make all the SOA that we observe. As an example, I took the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, or BTEX, as I'll be abbreviating for the rest of the talk, I calculated the amount of SOA they could produce for the different cities and found that they explain about 10% of the total SOA production. And if I take the assumption that instead of the 
yields I used here that they make SOA 100% of the time, I'm still only explaining about 35% of the SOA production across the megacities. So why is there this correlation and what's the missing source of the SOA? And that's where Brian McDonald's work comes in. So in his 2018 paper for Los Angeles, he showed that both for vehicle emissions and volatile consumer products, which include like paint and adhesives, you have emissions of your aromatics that are your benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, as well as your emissions of your intermediate volatile organic compounds. And in Los Angeles, there was a ratio of about 2.3 IVOC to BTEX for all the emissions in the basin. So since this is the most robust study that's looked at emissions, we took the assumption that this 2.3 IVOC to BTEX for all cities around the world and calculate how much SOA could be coming from IVOX, think, assuming that this ratio remains constant. So I, what I did was I calculated the amount of IVOC concentrations from BTEX, calculated their SOA yield, and added them to the SOA yield from BTEX, assuming a lower yield, and we got this slope. So it explains about 70% of the total SOA being produced in the urban areas. So yeah, there's still a missing 30%, which could come from like biogenics, other aromatic compounds that aren't intermediate volatile organic compounds and things like that. But in general, this approach is able to explain and identify the variability and explain what's going on with SOA production. So with that, we can start trying to probe to see how many deaths could be reduced if we were able to eliminate these precursors of SOA in urban areas. So the way that we do this is we use the simple model, which is something that Alma Hajik and Jose Jimenez introduced in 2011, and Patrick Hayes further explained in his 2015 paper. And the idea behind that is you take your dilution-corrected SOA concentration, plot it versus time, and then you constrain a first-order production rate of SOA with the observations as shown here. And then you take this constrained equation and you can put it in a chemical transport model to more realistically represent the SOA concentration in urban areas. So this is what Dusong did for Geoschem version 12. And what I've plotted here is the total average PM 2.5 as modeled at the surface of Geoschem. And we see that there's high concentrations over Sahara Desert, high concentrations in India and China. So things are making sense where the concentrations are. But then if we look at how much of the urban SOA composes the total particulate matter, we see that the regions of high urban areas start really highlighting, especially down one of these regions. So the, the urban SOA represents, on average, 15 to 20 percent of the total aerosol in these areas. So then we took satellite observations of PM 2.5 to calculate the total mortality for the year, which was around 3.3 million, which is on par to the 3 to 4 million that's been predicted for premature mortality due to particulate matter each year. And then when we take the fraction of urban SOA from Geoschem and calculate that to the total fraction of PM 2.5, and then we remove it, we can determine how the number of deaths change by removing the urban SOA, which is what's shown here. The number percent number of deaths that have decreased because there's no emissions of urban SOA precursors. And we see that by removing these precursors, we eliminate around 400,000 deaths per year. And it's especially important in the big megacities, you're seeing Mexico City pop up, London, Shanghai, Seoul, Tokyo. So removing these urban precursors that produce SOA would be very beneficial in reducing the premature mortality due to poor air quality. So in conclusion for this section, found that SOA production across megacities is highly correlated with aromatic emission reactivity and that assuming a similar SI or semi semi and intermediate volatile organic compound emissions for all megacities, we can explain around 70% of the SOA across the megacities. And with this, we can, if we remove these emission sources from the urban areas, we can reduce the number of deaths per year by 400,000. 
And since I know there was a lot of detail in this, I want to go back to the three big questions and the takeaway points from this talk. That SOA production over soil is very rapid and produced through the folk chemistry of hydrocarbons and is mainly due to local emissions. The variability in SOA production is highly correlated to emission ratio reactivity. And this high correlation provides an ability to start constraining and understanding urban SOA and the number of deaths, which is around 400,000 per year. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great, Brent. Are there any questions? Do I have to use the mic? Yes, we have to use the mic. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. That was a great talk. Um, okay, I have a couple questions. But my first question, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. My first question is, um, your very first slide, you showed that there, was, there were clean days. Do you have anything in your model to describe why there's variability? So what is causing the variability? Why are there some days that are super, super dirty and other days that aren't? And does that mean that you actually have represented in just your Korea data all of the variability that you see all around the world? So um, with the Korean data, with the flight observations, there was not enough data to separate clean versus dirty. Once I started doing that, it became very noisy and the statistics were just going out of whack. It's a question that we have been working as a science team for the final report because that's one of the big questions that the government and policy people have been asking is why these days are clean and these days are dirty. Our general hypothesis right now is that the clean days tend to be associated when it's surprisingly stagnant. And the reason behind that is that you have bigger boundary layer, so you're not able to build up as much aerosol. And even though it's staying there for a while, it's just not building up to the concentrations that they care about. But during non-stagnant days, which typically are associated with cold fronts and clouds and more aqueous type chemistry, you're bringing pollution in from China, which can act as a catalyst to increase the concentration of the aerosols from the local emissions. So I've been taking the average of the entire campaign, which will include the variability of the clean and dirty days. But if you look at the clean days versus dirty days, the error bars increase a little bit. But in general, I've been trying to get the variability by just looking at the average. Okay. The other question I had was um, when you were calculating our aromatics um, to delta CO, are you trying to look at... Are you trying to estimate what the actual emission ratios would be, or are you using what's at the actual what's measured at the plane? I'm using the actual emission ratios because the conceptual model I'm trying to say is that what we're looking at is the integrated production. So I don't care about what's happening at that point in the airplane because that that's not representative of the total history of the air. So the emission ratio reactivities are the actual emission ratios that have been reported by some people in this room, but it's also been values that I've calculated when the values aren't there for the airplanes by taking the account of how much hydrocarbon was lost during that time before we sampled it. Thanks. Thank you. Are there more questions? I was just kind of curious about... Um, the SOA production in general, when you, what do you, I mean, you didn't, you kind of skipped over in a way, it seems like the hydrocarbons and precursors that are ultimately responsible for it in a speciated way. Um, maybe I missed it. I didn't okay. talk about it because I was trying to figure out how to fit into the talk and then I just felt like it would be easier as a supplement discussion later. So I, took the observations during course AQ to try to understand what were the main precursors during this campaign. So what I've plotted here is the observed OA dilution corrected value and then the contribution from various VOCs that I calculated using observations on board the DC-8, taking the photochemical agent into account. So I'm trying to calculate how much SOA was produced from these hydrocarbons from the point of emission. We find that the biogenics in green, alkanes in orange, and very small alkenes in blue make a very small fraction. These alkenes right here are mainly from styrene. So styrene was 
there was a lot of styrene in Seoul, and it being an aromatic is very good at making SOA. Then this is benzene and ethyl benzene right here, and then toluene is making up a large fraction, and then the xylenes and trimethyl benzene. So between trimethyl benzene, xylenes, toluene, and benzene, you can explain about one third of the SOA production over Seoul. And then the rest of it I'm attributing to semi, semi and intermediate volatile or organic compounds that I estimated a couple different ways from what's been reported in literature and found that they can explain about another third of the SOA. So my perspective is that SI vox are the important species from what I calculated for course AQ and then what's been calculated in Los Angeles and Mexico City and other places and that biogenics are minor. Does okay, that, that was going to be my second question. Okay. There's one city that I'm looking into still that they say biogenics are important and that's London during their campaigns. I'm trying to figure out how I can better constrain it because they estimate maybe 30% of the SOA is coming from biogenics and I'm trying to see if I can constrain it to be that value as well or higher or lower. Can you go back just to that last your last slide then? So okay, is that surprising to you? Your 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 um, I'm looking at the variability in SOA production. Right. I mean, it, it looks good. I mean, you've you've closed the gap there with what you've um, you've done, but there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of assumptions in a way there, right? Right. The biggest assumption is that the IVOC emission ratio is right. ratio to benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene is constant. And we agree that's a huge assumption, but there is currently no databases like what Brian produced for Calnex. He's been in discussions with us about creating a similar database for all the cities, and we realized that that would take about 10 of years of a couple of postdocs jobs to get that. So this is our best estimate at the moment. Fair enough. Thanks. Are there more questions? I actually have a quick question in the ratio that you showed, in the other slide you showed, you showed at about 0.4 photochemical age, it was decreasing, and then it increased again in the ratio, in the organic aerosol ratio to CO ratio. Oh, that would just be due to variability in the measurements. So there's just some variability when you're flying that might, might not be getting everything that is in the boundary layer versus outside the boundary layer and other things that can just draw things down. So I would call that natural variability. There are more questions? If not, let's thank Ben again. Okay.